Hey guys, welcome back and thank you again for listening. We appreciate all of your support. This week, uh, a little bit different with Dog Bone Podcast number 12. Uh, it's actually, we had a chance to sit down with some real good friends of ours from the hunting public um, at Deer Fest a couple weeks ago and had a conversation that, that I guess formally you could call it a podcast. But we talked dogs, we talked uh, another project that is hot and heavy in my life right now, which is a, a product that we call the Licking Stick. Um, the first half of this podcast is going to be, we're talking dogs, just like we normally do. These guys, uh, big deer hunters, just like us. And if you're a deer hunter, uh, I think you'll probably get something out of the second half of the podcast. If you're not a deer hunter, just push stop. It's that simple. But, uh, thank you again so much for your support. Uh, we are in the studio. We're recording more podcasts as we, as we speak literally. So, uh, thank you so much for all your help. Thank you for your support. Continue to listen to us, continue to subscribe, and continue to leave us reviews if you'd be so kind. Thanks again. What's up, guys? It's Aaron at the Hunting Public with Jake. Jake at the Hunting Public. At the Hunting Public. <laughs> uh, on today's episode, we're going to have a pretty cool show for you. We are here at Deerfest right now in West Bend, Wisconsin. Yep. And we're going to have Jeremy Moore on from Dogbone. Yep. I'm interested to talk about some of his new stuff he's got going on. The lick and stick. The lick and stick. Yeah. I've been following him on social media, watching all the videos that have been posting of that thing working pretty well, it looks like, all times of year. So. Yeah, and this dude knows more about training dogs than anybody <laughs> that I've ever met in yep. my life. So. Yeah, I like talking to Jeremy. Yeah, he's a good egg. But uh, before we get into the show, we want to cover some of the stuff that we're doing right now. We have just wrapped up the Mapping Whitetail series. We're getting ready to do the live podcast on that. Yep, Monday. Um, by the time this airs, that... That live podcast will probably be up, actually. <laughs> so check it out. Yeah, so check it out. But we've also got lots of cool stuff on the channel right now. Ted Miller has been filming a bunch of big velvet bucks. Oh, yeah, we're hoping to join up with him pretty soon and uh, yep. go out and film with him, too. Yep, we got some more summer scouting stuff. We got a trail camera video, uh, review video coming up on the channel here real soon, plus some... Uh, some hunts that we're going to show before we get into the deer tour. One, uh, a friend of mine killed a giant, giant buck in Missouri last year with a bow. Well, I'm excited to see it. I, this is the first time I heard about it. So. Yeah, he killed it. Like, this thing is 200-inch deer. It's <laughs> nuts. And uh, sent us the footage, and we're going to have that on the channel here real soon. So if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, you can find it on YouTube at The Hunting Public. Check it out. But let's get to some ads before we get into the show with Jeremy. Yep. We are brought to you by Legendary Whitetails. We're actually sitting in their booth right now here at Deer Fest. It's an awesome booth. If you're not here or if you didn't come here, you you're should. a loser. <laughs> no, we're just kidding. But uh, we got a sweet promo code with Legendary right now. You can save 10% off of everything that they have site-wide, legendarywhitetails.com. Just use the promo code THP18. Mm -hmm. They're going to be coming out with that hunt guard line pretty soon here. Keep an eye out for that. They got a lot of new, not a lot of new stuff, but some pretty cool new stuff coming out this fall. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's uh, we wore a lot of it, especially late season last year mm -hmm. um, for some of those hunts where we had the beard sickles and stuff <laughs> going on. It's pretty sweet. Uh huh. We're also brought to you by the Onyx Hunt app. You can find it at onyxmaps.com. We'll post links below in the description. You can save 20% on everything that they have. Just use the promo code THP. Now, that's case sensitive, and it only works on their website. So go to onyxmaps.com, save you 20%, use caps, all caps. Make sure you use all those capital letters. I don't want to hear any of you guys telling us that it's not <laughs> working because if you do THP in all capital letters, it's going to work. On onyxmaps.com. You can't go and buy it on Google Play you got to go to onyxmaps.com. And that's the, the mapping product and app that we use every day mm -hmm. when we're out there scouting. So got a lot of cool features. Yeah, it does. And if you're looking for a place to hunt, it's a great thing to have mm -hmm. because it's going to show you the public and it's private show land. all the public land and the private land owners if you're trying to gain permission. So. Yeah. So don't mess around. Get Onyx. Boom. How's that for a <laughs> promo? <laughs> we're all... <laughs> yeah. Greg's back here making fun of me. <laughs> We're also brought to you by Woodhaven Custom Calls. Yep. You can find all their stuff at woodhavencustomcalls.com. We use them during turkey season. We're going to be using their deer calls this fall. They are some of the most realistic sounding calls. That, that, that grunt call is the most use. realistic grunt call I've ever used. Yeah. 
It is. And it's orange, so you're not going to lose it. So, <laughs> Zach will probably lose his. Yeah, he probably will. He loses everything. <laughs> but that's okay. It also has, like, that flexible tube, so you can kind of – Make uh, some realistic sounds, kind of make that little roar at the end. Oh, yeah. I like it. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. You can save 10% on all their gear, all their calls, site-wide, woodhavencustomcalls.com. Use our promo code THP2018. We'll post links to that as well in the description below. And last but not least – we're brought to you by Vortex Optics, and they have a wide variety of optics to choose from on their website, vortexoptics.com. They got binos, rangefinders, spotting scopes, scopes for your rifle, tripods, all and kinds of stuff. If you got any question, uh, customer service is hands down some of the best out there, yep. and their warranty if, if anything breaks or anything like that, unfortunately, they, have they, they like, will replace it. I, don't, I mean, they have one of the best warranties crazy. in the optics world out there today. And uh, they stand behind their stuff. We've been using it. It's awesome. Like that's why it, we use it. <laughs> that's exactly why we use it. It's a great fit for what it is that we do. Uh, and they, what we really like about Vortex is that they have something for everyone. Affordable you, to real high end stuff. Yep. So. If you if you want to buy and the affordable stuff is high quality as well. That's it why is. we're using the affordable stuff. So. Yeah. I mean, if you want some a pair of cheaper binos that you're going to beat around with, you know, they they work great. Mm -hmm. We've used them all. So check them out at vortexoptics.com. Now let's get to the show, shall we? We shall. Oh, it's Friday at Deerfest, guys, and we're in the legendary booth right now. Just got our buddy Jeremy Moore sat down to visit with us. How's it going, dude? It's, it's been going, a while. It's going really well, and first off, I want to thank you guys for having me. We really thanks appreciate for it. being here. You are very welcome, and thanks for bringing Ben totally. and the dogs <laughs> along. Absolutely. The dogs Absolutely. are always a big hit at these shows. They don't. People don't come to see me, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> that's funny. Those are new. The, yeah. That's, uh, so we brought Spry, which is uh, a puppy from Taylor, the White Tails Unlimited dog. Ah. And Spry is the dog that we did uh, live with Spry with which was like a series that we did on um, Facebook, and now it's migrated to our YouTube channel. But it, we, we basically raised Spry from like seven weeks old up to – I quit recording them probably a few months ago now. Um, not that we're done done with it, but I just haven't been doing a whole lot of new stuff with her. We're just starting to get into some new stuff with her. So I have been recording it and not going live so much more, just recording it and then – Ben's getting it up to our YouTube channel. So it's just kind of so an basically extension. basically that was when she was how old till? From about seven weeks till she was a probably a year and three three months. Mm -hmm. And she's, a, she's about a year and a half now. Her birthday is December something. So basically it was a good opportunity for people that have puppies to follow along totally. how you train your dog. Totally. And it, and it, and it started out. Like, we didn't even know what it was going to be. Mm -hmm. Like, we, it, we were fooling around. My wife, actually, and, and that's the thing is if you look up, if you look up that series, we made a playlist. Uh, ben made a playlist on our YouTube channel. And the, when it started out, it was my wife in our living room with my phone, and she was just recording live because we had never gone live before. It was kind of yeah. when it was new or mm -hmm. whatever. And so we just started fooling around and recording her on her place. That's where she is right now on her place. And she was little, like s just over seven weeks. And so we did it, and, it, and you, if you watch it, you'll realize, like, we're just messing around. Mm -hmm. Then we did it again, like, a couple days later. Uh, I d went live again just to kind of experiment with it, was doing something with Spry. And then we got, like, three or four messages after that, and people asked, how come you're not showing your dog anymore? And I'm mm -hmm. going, well, what do you mean? <laughs> and so we didn't realize that people actually kind of liked to see mm -hmm. that. And then, so then we said, well, why don't, maybe we should do it. So a couple, probably like, I don't know, a few into it, we actually started to like make it into, let's do this recording of this young pup. And then like several weeks later, we said, we probably should call it something. Mm -hmm. So then we called it Live with Spry and, and that was hands down. Oh, probably the, the awesome. most well-received thing we've mm -hmm. done like yeah man i think the cool thing about it was i mean it's a daily thing that you're doing so i mean obviously people know that have dogs that there is setbacks and you right. got you got to show all that and that's totally. kind of the same thing people like about our videos it's not just you're training them and they're listening and everything's yes. going great you're showing what happened what do you do when something goes or they start doing something that's for sure wrong definitely not a demonstration like i think I think there's value in seeing demonstration with dogs. I think it's frustrating to see demonstration with dogs because if your your dog doesn't do it that way for the first time. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think that was the 
I know it was the best received from those who watched it was when we when when we had problems and mm -hmm. I had plenty like yeah because people I, don't know what to do when there's a problem. exactly exactly Nobody and no one that. wants to show the problems mm -hmm. I think that was the other part was by doing it live it really changes the element because you just can't cover stuff up mm -hmm. like you don't know what you're gonna it's get it's easy and I do it I'm guilty of it it's easy for me to record a session with the dog and they look terrible and I go Pfft, I'm not gonna I show, show I'm not gonna show that right but when you went live. You couldn't not, and so what it did, it what it did was it just gave us a really good opportunity to show exactly what happens when I'm training, and and it was real time. So people like I, I liked the interaction. There's a lot of it ended up getting like long. Like I would work the dog for 15, 20 minutes because that's about all she could do, and then all of a sudden like I'd answer questions because that was mm -hmm. the the value of having it live. Right. People could send me a question, yep. and then we could talk about that. So it really ended up developing into a real cool series that um i think it probably helped more people with their dogs than yeah. any of our other stuff I, dude i, I, I could I, just I, see that i like, had a buddy that got a dog when you started doing that and yeah. he, i know he's thankful for it totally so. uh and that's that was what was cool and the other thing that was cool is as people started as people got puppies they really kind of like i they would send us a message and i'd say go back on youtube at, t at the time we didn't have it on youtube we had it on facebook well it got really hard just scroll back so far mm -hmm. on Facebook. Right. So then that's when uh, Ben helped us out and was able to get it, all of it just transferred to YouTube. Mm -hmm. And then from YouTube, it was just created as a playlist. So now if you get a puppy now, like the same, it's all there. You go can back. just go back and you can watch the, the, the hurdles that we had. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what that is exactly what I would want to watch. Totally. Like it's a day to day thing. We do I mean, we do training DVDs. Like I've got, mm -hmm. I've got DVDs. Those are formal. Like those are produced. They're organized, uh, they're chaptered, they're laid right. out. They're val there's value in them. I think there's value in them. The problem is is the dogs don't watch the DVDs mm -hmm. with you, and they don't understand when the next chapter is supposed to come. <laughs> yeah. And so it just, it just happened. Mm -hmm. And that was exactly what happened when we did Spry. When I'm sure you get commonly asked questions, and now instead of typing out a long answer that people may not understand, you can just reference exactly what you probably did in those videos and they yeah. can go to that point. And I try to, but I'm such a sucker. <laughs> I, t I spend so much time writing emails uh -huh. back. And uh -huh. My wife is, you should just come up with some pre-recorded. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is even those, they always have a little twist. Yeah. You know, people always have a little twist. And that's, but that is one of the things that I really like about, you can, you can, talk, up, you can talk about social media stuff. It can be really good. It can be really bad. You can, it's how you use it. Mm -hmm. And, like, I really, we really stress the idea of, like, for us, it's the best marketing tool we have. It's the best platform we have to get information to people. I just think it's super, super valuable, and it's so easy. Like, we, I think people have become accustomed to and are, are okay with the idea of it's not produced. Right. Like, no, they love, they love that aspect. It's the best way it. for you to get feedback. You need, you totally. know exactly what your customers want then. Totally. Yeah. And it's just, it's hands on every yeah. single day yeah. as you're, as you're going and, and you're really illustrating your thought process through the entire thing. And Absolutely. that's how they learn. Right. You know, and what's interesting is, you know, the, one of the things that I get into trouble with is live with spry. A lot of people watch live with spry and then I'll get a message of, I saw this on episode 63. Mm -hmm. We're, we've done it all to that. And 64, you did this, and my dog didn't do it. And I, so I have to make a point of saying, just because Spry did it that way doesn't mean Ellie, the other dog next to her, did it that way. Mm -hmm. Tito, the dog I'm training right now, Elsa, the dog I have. Like, those dogs all do it at different times. Mm -hmm. So I have to remind people that Live with Spry is a good roadmap it's going to give you some specific things, but it's not like the step-by-step -step mm -hmm. manual. That dog did not make a retrieve until she was over eight months old. Like, she didn't make a retrieve. And so... Because you didn't think she was ready for it? Because she wasn't good. Okay. Because <laughs> she sucked. Sure. Like, she just wasn't very good at <laughs> it. Mm -hmm. Right. She had a really hard time with natural retrieve. It's the first time I've ever had a dog that had that. Hmm. Ellie here, no problem. Like, Ellie was retrieving really well. Real early, like we're talking like eight, nine, ten weeks old. Spry would run out to get it. She had a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of go. She'd run out to get it. She'd pick it up. She had no problem picking it up. She wouldn't bring it back. Hmm. She would not bring it back. Hmm. And so I was real frustrated. Like I had, 
I had a lot of, <laughs> I had a lot of moments where I was mm-hmm. glad I was live because <laughs> it probably uh, it probably helped me with my patience. Mm-hmm. Sure. Because I went, I can't look like a total yeah. jerk right now, yeah. and I want to. Like mm-hmm. I want to punt the dog, <laughs> and I can't. Uh-huh. And so, it slowed me down, and it made me go, well, what am I gonna do? Mm-hmm. And I tried like four or five things because I I've done that before with dogs mm-hmm. and found success with it. And every time she wouldn't do it. Hmm. So it ended up, it was real interesting because she started making retrieves for me at probably like between eight and nine months. She did it live. Like I, I could go back and find out. It was somewhere between eight and nine months. And it just took a little longer. And so my, my takeaway from it was some things just take longer. Mm-hmm. And every dog's different, and that's okay. Yeah. I think that's yeah. an personalities ad- too. Yeah, yeah. I think that's an advantage, though. Really, like if you kept doing, keep doing this, is right. what I would advise. Right. Right. You know, with every one that you right. get, you know, because that's tell the- my wife that. <laughs> that's you know, a lot of that's, do you know? Like, so th- I agree. That's where he comes in, isn't it? <laughs> needs to. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no. I, th- th- I totally agree. Ben, you're the man, by the way. <laughs> it's an incredible added layer to doing it. Well, it's no different than this. If you were hunting, if you as a hunter, to go out and hunt or to try to go out and hunt and film it, adding that extra layer mm-hmm. is a lot, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Now try to do it all live. <laughs> like yeah. that is that put that makes it so much tougher and it makes it so much more time consuming. And it but at the same time the positives of it is is it keeps you very, very committed to the process like right. i didn't I, there were days where i probably would have norm normally i would have said eh, i got a reason why i'm not going to train today but then i go but dan is going to send me a message right. and say how come you didn't where's spry <laughs> so there's this accountability that came with it that i went yeah i'll i'll do it and it, and we got this momentum going with it so maybe you're fueling my fire to inspire <laughs> even me. if you can't do it live all the time yeah I would still shoot it the same yes, way and totally. post it. Totally. Because you, you, like YouTube is exactly the same as Facebook as far as social goes right. in that regard. Like it's a communication tool. Right. People are going to tell you on YouTube. Right. Exactly they're gonna what ask, they want to see. Yes. Right. right. And they're going to comment right there. And But the good thing with it is you can either go live or you can post it. Totally. Later. Totally. And I, and I love the idea of I did really enjoy the interaction live. Mm-hmm. Like there was a ton of value there. Yeah. Because – People can ask a question and send it to me, and I'll answer it the best I can. Yeah. But there's a lot of times where I got to go, what, a, what, what about this? Mm-hmm. And ask a question back, do you do this? How old is the dog? You need a what, more specific yeah. question from them. Yeah. So then all of a sudden, boom, they fire it back. Mm-hmm. And so now we've got this little dialogue going. That was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but, you know, it, it, was, it was one of those things where for us right now, it's like, we just have so many little projects going. We got another one called Project Mighty Pet. That's a, a Tuesday. It's a scheduled thing. We go. We work with this group. Uh, it's a store called Mighty Pet. We work with them. We're changing their culture. We're changing their the, the training within their organization. And that's something that, like, from that, we try to do some social stuff. We're trying to do some YouTube stuff. So we created a playlist. So we've d- we started that without knowing what we were going to do. I just ended up going there and filming it with my phone. And it was some of the best yep. information. <laughs> yep. And I was like, damn, I'm so glad I recorded that. <laughs> and then now he comes with me and records it. Yeah. And so it gets better. Now now it's a little more, it's just better. It's more better, polished. Better angles and all that stuff. And then now he's editing it slightly. Like mm-hmm. we're not cutting, we're not really editing. We're putting an intro and putting a close. Yeah. But That's what people want, It's though. creating such natural, candid stuff. Raw. Yep. And I, I just think when it comes to dog training, to me, there's more value in that than staged stuff. Yeah. Oh, you know, like I would 100% percent agree. Nobody, so, 100%. I, I, I guess I don't know a lot about people that are training dogs, but I can't imagine there's other people that are doing like something so raw where it's not just polished. It's well, I think it's risky. Mm-hmm. So here's the here's the thing. I'm not a dog trainer. That's not our business. Okay. Our business isn't bring dogs in. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't bring dogs in. I train dogs for clients. I've got four right now. Um, they're dogs that I'll keep for anywhere from a year, year and a half, two years. doesn't matter. There's no time limit on it. Mm-hmm. I do it really strange. I do it totally different than any other trainer. Mm-hmm. I don't put time limits on stuff. You get a dog for me, the dog's going to go home when I'm ready, you're ready, and the dog's ready. So 
it's not a good business model. We don't make much money on it. <laughs> um, but but we don't. We're not a dog training company. Yeah. We don't need dogs to come through our doors to stay in business. We sell products. We sell training products to people that want to train their dog. I use the products. I've developed the products. The dogs are my way of making sure the products work. Mm-hmm. And the other part of it is, is I love training dogs. Like, I really enjoy it. To me, I've seen it way too many times. When you start turning lots of dogs through, which is, is it's a snowball effect where if, you're, if your business is training dogs, you have to train a lot of dogs. And then as you train more dogs, you have to train more dogs because as your overhead grows, you'll have to get more income. So it's a slippery slope. Yeah, it's hard to maintain your quality, quality. control then. Absolutely. I'd you're rather just do less dogs and the make them better. That's my goal. Mm-hmm. Right. Less dogs, better dogs. Mm-hmm. So, But what, what I look at it is, is I love doing it. And the problem I'm going to have is if I decide... If I decide to do more and more and more dogs, I know for a fact I'll get burned out. I just will. Yeah. And if I get burned out training dogs, I'm not developing any more products because I'm going to be done with the dog thing. Right. I love doing the dogs. Mm-hmm. I don't want to get ever burned out or even think twice about doing it. Like right now I've got four that are clients plus three that are ours. And I'm supposed to train ours too. My dogs always kind of take, take the back Second seat play. a little bit. But you know what? My dogs usually end up best, and the reason is because is I'm more patient with them. Right. Like, I, I, Ellie that right there, I have zero rush with her. Like, she'll get where she needs to get when she gets there, and she's probably going to turn out to be one of the finer dogs I've trained. I know it. And, and it's because I've put zero pressure on myself to get her through. I don't care when she's done. She's two, she's, I think she's about two and a half. My wife would know. I, I think she's about <laughs> two and a half. Uh, she... Went on her first hunt last year. I took her on her first hunt. She was over two years old. And a lot of people would go, man, at two years old, I got a couple seasons under him. <laughs> my, my thought process is this. If I take my time and give up a season or two, I'm going to have ten great seasons. Right. Because when they're ready, they're going to be ready. I don't need to get 11 seasons that are mediocre at best because I got that extra one season in. I'd rather wait. Yeah. And I'm just... I think one of the biggest things that people overlook and don't think about when it comes to dogs is everyone wants to know the mechanics of how to get this stuff done, and we want to be efficient, and we want to be quick and all that stuff. With some things, I, I'm the same way. With dogs, I look at it and I go, what's the rush? We, we, we forget about the idea of they could care less about how old they are or how long they've done something. It's about patience and, and exercising patience when I work with them. And so... One of the biggest things I get out of the do- working with the dogs is an understanding and a reminder of that patience. And then I can transfer that to a lot of other parts of my life. That was deep, wasn't it? That was good. It I was. Liked that. that was really was good. Interested. You had me, you know, the whole time there. No doubt. Yeah, and I mean, you're going to have the dog for his whole life. It, yeah. There's you know, no reason. Every to, case. There's no reason to rush it. No reason. That's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I want to talk about the licking stick. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. Uh, Maybe before we dive into that, uh, you've talked about your YouTube channel. You've yeah. talked about social media. Yep. Where can people find that? It's all at Dogbone Hunter. So it's a, it, uh, we'll post links to that too, guys, yeah. underneath. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's at Dogbone Hunter. Uh, that's our Facebook, our Instagram, and our YouTube. We have Twitter too. I don't even know what a Twitter is. But <laughs> uh, it's linked to my Facebook, I guess. But um, So we're, we're pr- I'm, I'm pretty active. Like I use it. Yeah. A lot. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like a nerd sometimes because of it. But, uh, and I'm late getting into it. Like, we're just not social. I'm not a social honk. Like, my pr- I have a personal page. I don't use it very often. Like, I looked at it the other day, and I was like, man, there's like four posts this last year that I did <laughs> on my personal. But, like, I'm on dog bone or I'm on licking stick, Non-stop. like, constantly. Mm-hmm. Because it's, for a small company like ours, like, that is our lifeline. Mm-hmm. Like, that's our way to connect to our customer. That's the easiest way for me to help people. Mm-hmm. Like, I, we, on the way down, we had three phone calls of people, uh, just follow-up calls on different stuff. And one of the guys was uh, a friend of ours that we met through ATA. We met him at ATA. He had a pup. Um, we helped him out with some of his training stuff, getting this pup started. And at the end of it, we were actually talking about Licking Stick. That was the mm. call that we were having. And then at the end of it, he said, dude, I have to thank you for that dog stuff because there's no way I have w- this pup of ours where it is without it. And I think a lot of it was live with Spry. Like, he watches yeah. our social stuff, and mm-hmm. he he's 
from there he's migrated to our YouTube. So it's just it's it's such an easy way to get information to people now. You guys know. I yep. mean, yeah. It's simple. It is. It is very simple. People overcomplicate it, you know, totally. n- nowadays and they just I don't know why that is. I guess it's just because of mainstream media and what it has done in the last 15 years. Right. You right. know, and right. so many have it in their head that this is what you have to do. Right. Right. You know, but oh, uh, there's such a shit for though. me. I've barely been alive 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> With a mustache like that, you're over 15. <laughs> yeah, dude. Up. Don't yeah. kid yourself. When we got him, he was like, you know, <laughs> he just had 18, 17. Is what he looked like anyway. He wasn't that young. <laughs> now he just he went from being what 22, 23 to 38 in 23 a matter of months. <laughs> Like yeah. that, man. It never s- going on 38. It doesn't yeah. slow down, brother. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, For now, at least. Yeah, so let's get into so the licking stick. licking stick, man. It's so, pretty sweet. So, yeah, so I, I think what's really interesting is, and I don't think many people know, uh, is that we're, we're Scott and I, I'm a business partner. Um, the licking stick is ours, is, is something that we've, we've developed, designed, um, the story behind it is, is it's a buddy. I was a buddy of mine that discovered it. Like, first off, we didn't. Dis- I don't think we really discovered anything. We just came to a realization that deer do certain things. Mm-hmm. So, it was a buddy of mine that planted a food plot. I hunted. I, it was a buddy that I hunted with years ago. He planted a food plot. He went in, put it into the woods, got done with the food plot, and there was one little sapling that just didn't get worked on it. So it's a you know brushy area. He planted it. This one little sapling didn't get clipped off. So at the end of the day, he said, hell with it, and he left it. And so it came back, and he checked that food plot, and it was all coming in except around the little sapling. And the little sapling was really beat up with dirt. Like the dirt wasn't growing, tracks all over. Yeah. So he goes, man, what, 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 why? You know, so he puts a camera on it. He had so many deer. Like, and this guy knows his bucks. Like he knows every deer on his property. Right. So he's getting all these bucks to it. So he told me about it, and I go, huh why you know so we weren't sure why this was i mean this was 2007 2008 and so then what we did was we said i said i love it i love the idea of it but i don't know why exactly can we replicate it and so we started doing different ways of doing it like we had weird designs that didn't work very well um you know i drove a pipe in the ground and i put a stick in it (laughs) and then i came back and just broke off and then i did a different design with this anchoring system in the base and then it was laying on the ground when i came back (laughs) so we're trying to figure out how do we get what they did on accident to happen so and it was i don't know why i thought of it but for some reason i envisioned this this spring action i thought well it can take some pressure it should come back so i went to a store i found a spring a hardware store i thought might work i brought it to a buddy he welded it up we we tried it man it it just it stood up it always stood up and the deer loved it and and it so didn't break because he had that didn't spring. break right and so they like that give too yeah. totally ted I think miller talks about they play yeah ted, they ted when he it. puts those horizontal rubs up there yeah. he doesn't fasten them down as tight as right. possible he leaves them so that the deer can totally. move it totally. and they just like get into something. it yeah. yeah yeah and and what we found was it wasn't just bucks like i think a lot of people we we post a lot of videos and pictures of bucks it's not just bucks mm-hmm. it's a communal thing that all these deer in your in that area are using and they're using it to kind of keep tabs of each other it's like yeah it's like a water cooler at an office Mm -hmm. like they're all going to come to it at some point Mm -hmm. and so we we thought man i think we can put this where we want i think that's part of the reason it works is because when we put something in a new spot where deer aren't used to seeing something right they're very curious so you anchor this thing so so the the actual design of it came through a ton of trial and error over a couple seasons actually mm-hmm. and like we ben just did a video recently um and we talked about how man trail cameras have changed a lot <laughs> over the last however many years oh yeah the way this thing works hasn't and so we showed some videos from 2008 2009 they're blurry they're pixelated they look like you're watching a cartoon a little bit i mean yeah. they're just not that good of videos and then we jump to like today's cameras that are 4k and <laughs> super high quality and all this mm-hmm. stuff so in this little video that he put together for us our our story was we this this thing has worked like this since the beginning and before we were doing it the deer are just doing it in the woods mm-hmm. like i never realized it but i thought back when i sat in stands there were spots where these deer would go there's just one spot out of this stand that i would see 
a de- I, the first deer I saw on it, it was kind of off of a trail, and I saw this, I saw the throat patch, and I, I mean, it's just rubbing, like l- licking and working it, working its head up, you know, it's that classic shot where that deer's facing you, and you see him just working, and I'm yep. waiting for his head to tip forward and just see how big he is, right. and it's a doe, <laughs> and I go, are you shitting me, come on, <laughs> the, 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 why is this doe making a, a scrape, mm-hmm. is what I thought. So then it, they just I, all communicate through that. Totally. Mm-hmm. Well, then I went over and I looked at it and I go, there's no scrape here. It's one little tree that's about the size of my finger that runs up and they're, it, they've, they've got it literally no branches on it. It's just a stick. And so I thought, that's really interesting. Well, then I started thinking about it and I saw so many deer using it over a long period of time. Well, that's what it was, but I just didn't realize it. And so now we say, we're looking at it and we're going, well, why don't we try to figure out how to jumpstart these things and create them where we want them. And I think the way to do that is just get one deer to work it. Yeah. Because once they scent market, mm-hmm. the next one will, and then the next one will. And so the beauty of it for me is it's real low pressure. Right. Like I can put a camera on it, and I can get them all to come to the same spot, and I don't have to go in there ever. I don't have to put bait down. I don't have to put minerals down. I don't have to – and it, first of all, it's elite – like. A lot of places it's illegal, mm-hmm. but even to put if minerals it, even down or bait or bait, yeah. yeah, in or out of season, there's a lot more and more places it's becoming illegal, mm-hmm. right? So, and there's a lot of places that's been illegal, but this is that's part of it that I, you know it gets expensive and all that stuff. I don't care if I'm getting good pictures, I'll do it if it's legal. But the problem I have with it is now I have to go there every day, mm-hmm. and I worry about my pressure on the deer more than anything. Mm-hmm. So by me doing this. It's eliminating my need to have to go into the woods. And I think what really does it is the idea that if you go into my house, my house isn't perfectly in place. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, it's, you do a pretty nice job, right? So, but if you move the remote on my coffee table, I know. Because I just I know these little, if someone moves your boots, you wonder who moved your boots. Like you just, right. you have this sense about your house and your, yeah. your area. If someone puts a tree in your living room, you are going to notice it. And this is what we're doing to these deer. So we're putting a tree in a new spot, and it's like someone moved their remote. And they're going to go, that looks different. Yeah. And the curiosity, especially this time of year, they're so curious. They're going to, I think, immediately want to check it out. But what do they do? They go downwind. They're going to get downwind and go, what, 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 what is this? And so the, the visual part is key. The design of it to take the abuse that it takes, that's key. But then we put this scent on it. And it's a scent that I've made. I've changed it probably 15 times in the last nine years. But I like whatever it's at right now. It's a little, it's a little, uh, it's interesting. It smells uh, like you could drink it. Well, I don't recommend it. <laughs> no, it won't he, hurt. He was, I don't think it'll hurt you. Ben was telling uh, me he didn't recommend it yeah, either. But. I, it, it does smell good. Yeah, it, does. it smells good. There's no, there's no, na- there's no deer stuff in it. There's no, there's no um, glandular scent. There's no animal extract out of it. Right. It's all natural. Has no. There's no shelf life. I personally think it gets better as it gets older. I may have a secret little stash of my own that might be a couple <laughs> years old. Uh, I can't batch the stuff. I, I batch it myself, and right. I do it like 10 gallons at a time. So it's really like a small process. But we do age it before we send it out. But it, it creates – it's it's – it's hot, man. Like it's it's pressurized. You gotta be careful when you open it. Yeah. Like, and that's kind of. I think that's part of it. I and and so when they smell that, they can't help but really check it out. Mm-hmm. And as soon as they touch that stick, as soon as they touch that little sapling, nasal gland, preorbital gland, forehead gland, salivary gland. Four out of the seven glands on a white-tailed doe are on her face. Four out of eight are on a buck. It, it, they're touching it. Mm-hmm. They're scenting it. And so we have such an awesome video of every scent gland you can imagine. I have a buck that straddles it in one picture, and it's in between. Well, they have a penal sheath gland. Yeah. And I don't know if that's what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed that I just said that. But, uh, I don't know what they're doing, but he's got to be scent marking it, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have video of these deer that get up and they kick at it. Yeah. I don't know if they're trying to put their inner digital gland scent <laughs> on it. I like to tell the story. They do, but... It, they're definitely utilizing it as a scent post, uh-huh. and it's communal, and it is, it's just way easy to get them in front of my camera right. by doing that. And I would say, I would say also that, that um, 
a lot of folks think scrapes in general don't get hit and licking branches don't get hit until the fall. You're and it's wrong. not true. Yeah. I mean, we see it all the time. Like well, during he's got videos to prove it. I yeah, oh, follow yeah. Follow him on social media. Absolutely. Though. It intense. I think it. I think there's certain like. I think there's a difference, a distinct difference between a licking stick, a rub, a scrape. Now, a scrape is tied in a lot of times with the overhead licking with right. the overhead licking branch. So there, those are all communication tools. They're all a little bit different, and they all serve a little different, little little different role. Right. The thing about the licking stick is, and and it's perhaps disappointing to some, is you're not just going to get bucks on it. Like yeah. does, fawns. I have so many spotted fawns right now mm -hmm. that are interacting with it. We had a little nubby buck last year on it that, like, took it over. Like, he dominated <laughs> it. Like, it, you see this possessiveness come over them. Um, Scott's got some pretty good deer on it already this year, running each other off of it, and then they come back to it, and they mark it, and then they kind of walk, and then you'll see them run another deer off. But I think it's this thing where they're just jockeying. It's a hierarchy that mm -hmm. they live in. They're, fam they're family groups, and right. they intermingle, and... Um, they leave so much scent on there, like you said. Does, totally. bucks, every every deer in the yes. woods in that particular community, if you will. Yep. Yep. So and they're I, year round. They're constantly checking in there. Absolutely. To, to just see what everybody else is up to. Which is the value, I think, in putting them out early. Like, so here's here's like, it's really taught me a lot. Just kind of watching how these things worked over the last few years. First off, changing our cameras to video has made a huge difference. Now it's a pain to check cameras because we've got to watch a video. You can't just da, 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 da. Now I use pictures at times for t just to try to catch, get a picture. But on the licking sticks, we put them on video and I've learned more about deer watching video than I, because you just see other things that take place. And the, the thing about it is, is when you put it on picture, you might get a picture of a deer that walks by triggers, you get a picture. And you, might have a third, <laughs> right, and you might have a 30-second delay on it. And in that 30 seconds, a lot can happen. Mm -hmm. You know, like I've watched, I've sat there and watched licking sticks out of a stand and watched deer work them. And I went, oh, my God, this is going to be awesome. And then I pull the card. And the awesome part, my camera was cycling. Like right. I got <laughs> a video. It. You know, you just, you, you run this risk of missing. Now, I realize it takes a long time to check, check the cards, but the value is there. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've found that. It's just, it's real interesting to see this time of year, you're going to have like, I, I am looking for a lot of does and doe family groups to use it. The reason I am is because we've broken like, I love what the juries did with 13, like that this series of like right. phases of deer. And I think that's, I think there's, I'm able to learn stuff by that. Yep. Sure. That we've like, I don't know that I get that in depth to, but I can break it down into some real broad categories. Summer before the bucks go to velvet, that's one total category. They're they're buddies. They're together. They're kind of they're tolerant of each other. But these does and family groups hang together. Scent mark this licking stick, and they don't go anywhere. Like they're there. They might these deer. I have these deer that live behind my house. They're there all year long, and then they'll fawn there again next year, and they'll fawn there again next year. And as long as they don't get killed, they're going to be there or real cl or within you know within a reasonable amount distance wise. But as soon as I get bucks to come out of velvet, all of a sudden, I'm getting a new deer about every other week that comes. And the, they, when they come, they come to my food plot. If they're coming to eat or whatever they're doing, but they're going to the licking stick. And I think they're gathering information of how mm -hmm. many does are here. I think so. Which ones are here? How many have fawns? How many? Well, that, how many? And I'm thinking, like, those bucks that are on your property during the summer, I, I'm sure that everybody has it happen where they leave. Totally. And, and but they might come back one or two, three times during the fall. They're going to go right yes. to that area where they know every yeah. other deer has it's been. It's like there's the information center. Even if that is your only opportunity, totally. one or two or three days out of the year, I mean, Absolutely. If, if it's there, right. you know where they're going to be. It's just, it's, it's just so interesting to see how over the course of a year the, the same deer will continue to use it, same ones that live there. Yep. And then you get these drifters, and you get, like, I just want to put them, and, and for me, I really use it as a scouting tool. We, we've tagged this, this line, inventory pattern hunt. Like, I think it's simple, and I think it makes sense. I think it really describes what we're doing. We're going to take inventory because you're going to get just about every deer to use it at some point. You're getting a good inventory. Patterning, the hard part about it is can I get consistent? 
because they might be in my food plot, but they don't necessarily come to the stick. Right. They might be an hour later, but they were in the food plot. Yeah. So, so what I see the value in it is, is if you put your camera in the right way, you can at least figure out what direction they're coming from. Yeah. So it might not be like I'm this. I don't want people to think that. Oh my God, licking stick! It'll pattern my deer for me. No. It no more or less than. But if you put it up the right way, you can get a lot of information of direction. Sure get an idea of what si- where they're bedding where they're you know where they're going off to feed after so i think it's inventory it's pattern and then ultimately it's hunt and and ben just finished up a video my wife shot one uh her first buck with the gun had that deer in velvet had them on different licking sticks throughout the farm we really used them as tools to track that deer all year long she shot him with the gun we got him uh, he wasn't on the licking stick but the licking st- he's in the back of the licking stick when we shot him it's a real cool video but it's just, it allows us, my dad shot one coming to the licking stick. Like it came, it was on a food plot. It was coming to a spot. Well, he sets it up. I, I recommend it too. 20, 25 yards. Now you've got a yardage marker. Mm-hmm. Like it's there. You and know where the Ted, yardage Ted is. Ted Miller uses them for self-filming just to totally. take their attention off. Like Absolutely. If they're working that scrape, they're, they're not Absolutely. paying much They're attention. not looking at you and they're stopped right. and you right. can draw or right. they're in the spot where you want right. to kill them. You, you can move that wherever you want and it just sweetens exactly. your stand location. Exactly. It's the flexibility of being able to put it in front of the right spot for the right for your camera, in front of the right spot for your stand. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just... You're not saying it can work anywhere, but I mean, exactly. you can put it where you need it yes. and the deer need it. Like, right. Like you can't just throw it out way... No. I mean, it, I'm sure it would work, but... Pe- well, no, I, I don't know. And that's a great point because I think, I think some people think just... Uh, I think some people think you can put it in your backyard and you'll get a million pictures on it. If deer don't go through your backyard, it won't draw them in. Mm-hmm. Like this has to be in a spot that deer go. Yeah. Right. So like food plot, I have a food plot that's like maybe an eighth of an acre. It's, it's not very big, but I'm telling you right now, I've sat in trees and wa- and, and have a cam- one camera on that food plot. I could have 15 deer in that food plot and never get a picture of them because you have to put them in front of the camera. Yeah. Right. And so this, if this, this, what this does for me is... If they're coming to the food plot already, I might not get a picture of them unless this they come may bring to them this in front spot. of the camera. That's what it's doing for you. Mm-hmm. It's not going to draw deer from 200 yards away. It's going to take a deer that's in that area. It's gonna, like I like logging roads. I have this great set on on our farm that that it's a 90 degree turn on a logging road, so you can see it down both directions. I put it right in the corner. You can see it down both ways. But I always wanted to get. I know the deer cut cut through there a lot. I wasn't getting very many good pictures. And the trail, if you look at the game trails, they don't take the 90-degree turn in the logging road. They cut the corner. And so they're in this brush, and I just can't get a good picture of them. Put a licking stick in the corner. They see it when they're coming this way, and they see it when they're coming this way. And now they're, now coming. they're coming to it. And now because they were curious and they marked it, now they're coming to it again. And then they're coming to it again. And now all of a sudden I'm getting some, I'm getting some of the deer that I knew were in that woods, but I could never get a picture of them. Mm-hmm. Now I'm getting pictures of them. Because as soon as it starts, it snowballs. And now I'm just getting more and more and more. Mm-hmm. So that you don't have to, it's not just a food plot thing. I think it works really well in food yeah. plots. Uh, I, I put them in field edges. I put them in logging roads. Middle of the logging road. It's on a spring. I just drive right over it with the ATV. It just no big deal. pops back up. <laughs> like you don't have to drive around them. You know, you should pull them out when you disc. That's the other thing. A lot of guys bury big posts. Right. You know, rub posts and overhanging looking branch stuff. But then at the end of the season, if you want to disc it, what do you got to do? You either work around it, or which is a pain, right? Or you pull it out and you redo it. Boy, that's a lot of work. This yeah, is, is this is a, a mini version of it with a different, different, different. And role. you could potentially, I mean, yeah, this is a way easier to put place out there. If you were wanting to put something way, way back in somewhere, totally, totally. way easier. You're not to bringing post hole diggers, right? You know. uh, we we set up 15 of them on the farm we hunt. Um, two weeks ago we filmed a bunch of it so we're, I, we wanted to show why we're putting them out where we're putting them out and explain kind of the the idea behind it sure and so we put them in all sorts of different situations it, but i told him i told ben i said you know one of the things that stood out to me after doing 15 of them was how quick they are like it takes me longer to find a tree the right tree trim it down to put into it because you just use a lot you use a tree from the woods like you just cut a tree down trim it put it in it took me longer to find the right tree than it did to set the set the base up like i we're going to look back on it and we're going to i think we're going to make a video and, and we're going to do like three four of them and show them real fast forward 
and then go average time to set these up was like, I bitch, it's under four minutes because mm -hmm. it's two rebar stakes anchored down. And then it's set as long as you got it level. Then you got to go get your tree, put it in there, scent your tree up, and leave it alone. Do you have a preferred tree that you use? I, so I have had, it's a great question because people ask that a lot. Mm -hmm. I've I've not used cedar. I got a guy down by you. He's on he's in northern Missouri, but he's close to that border. He can't. He sent us so many pictures with little cedars in it. Now I don't have many cedars by us. With um, them hitting those limbs, those brushy little limbs coming yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's and so he's got like this little Christmas tree in it. Yeah. On our on our, I mean it sort of looks like to us. So I use popple a lot because mm. where I am, there's a lot of popple. It's real straight. It's real soft. It's real easy to use. Um, I I like that. I've had just as much luck with oak. I, the problem with oak is it's usually crooked. So yeah. it's hard to get it to fit into that spring and have it have it be tall enough. you got to have it tall enough. you got to have it balanced so it doesn't tip over. you got to have the right size diameter to get in the spring. Um, basswood is one that I used last year, and I didn't even know it was a basswood. Like, I had to ask my buddy. I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, what, <laughs> that's, right. what that, what, that's what that big, uh, big leaves. Triple, triple rub that we found or where I shot my buck was. Where oh, we yeah. That caramel basswood. It was a basswood rub. They love it. Ted Miller's farm, the only natural trees there that are rubbed are pretty much all basswood. Sure. I, I didn't know it was even basswood, but I, it was convenient, and it was there, and so I cut this one off, and I put it in, and we went back like three. I usually leave them for a couple weeks before I go check them, and I, we went back because we were there at the, over like a weekend. So I went at the very end, and I checked it, and I noticed all the leaves are gone. Like it was had a lot of leaves on it. And so I looked at the video. Well, these deer came in and they ate the leaves. Mm -hmm. They ate every leaf off of it, and I don't know why, but they must they must like it. Right. But as soon as they're eating it, their nose touches it. They got a gland right there, mm -hmm. nasal right. gland. Their mouth, salivary gland, instantly. All they have to they don't even have to intentionally hit it with a preorbital or a forehead. They can accidentally touch it and they've got scent on it. Mm -hmm. So I really, if I have a basswood available. I've been leaning towards that quite a bit. I know where our, our farm that we hunt over in Buffalo County, there's a lot of that. So we've been we've been using that quite a bit. I, I had a person send me a message this week that said, been out, been out for a week. They're not hitting it. Should I change the tree? I said, well, I think you should have something by now. I would try. I would I would change the tree or I change the location. I'd do something different. I'm not afraid to get a little bit aggressive, especially this time of year. Right. Yeah. You know, you go you go in this time of year. I, I I know guys have talked about like, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. Everyone's got their ways of doing stuff, but like I've had guys that are like, don't touch that tree without rubber gloves, and I'm yeah. going, dude, my dog just <laughs> marked it. Like I, you know, like I, I'm not I'm not that way, and I get and I get a lot of pictures on it. Now, right. Ted does the same thing. He brings his dog with him every time, and totally. he ends up with bucks all over. The yeah, I mean, rub. I get a lot of coyote pictures. Yeah, and so when I get coyote pictures, I go, hmm, I wonder if the deer mind them or me more or less you know right but i i just don't see i just don't see it impacting now and as i get closer and if i'm hunting and i'm getting closer to hunting season i'm probably gonna i'm definitely shifting up some of the things i do tactics wise mm -hmm. in the woods right but i'll be honest with you i don't i don't i don't spend a lot of time i don't waste i don't i don't waste a lot of time it, maybe it's not wasting but I don't worry about it. I've got a question for you what is what are your views on scent control like when you're going to hunt during the fall do you, do you practice any sort of scent control? Yeah. You do? Yeah. Uh, first off, I like the wind in my favor. You know, because I, I, I believe there's a lot of things that you can do to help you have a little bit of odds in your favor. But you got to remember, I'm a dog trainer, and my dogs have really good noses. Yeah. Right. And That's why I asked and, you. <laughs> and, those, and those deer, their life depends on their yes. nose. And so I don't know that I truly believe you're fooling their noses no. i don't think we can beat them um so i'm i do think there is science behind the idea of they can't smell me if they're upwind like right. if they're not down if they're not downwind of me they can't smell me mm -hmm. so i do think that um i do buy into some ozone stuff yeah. i don't think it's i don't think it means you can do everything else wrong and have it to save you i think it works and the only reason i think it works is because i read a study that canine a canine handler used and what he, they did this box test where this dog scented a human being inside the box, and it's a search and rescue thing. And they did a bunch of different tests. They, they sprayed with stuff. They did carbon suits. They did all these scent things that hunters talk about doing. And then they used an ozone unit. They put an ozone unit in it. And 
it took the dog longer to positive identify the bright box with the ozone unit running. So I'm looking at that and I'm going, if it's if it throws a little bit of a curveball at that trained dog, I'll probably look to have it as an advantage in the woods. I don't think any of it fixes everything. Mm-hmm. That's my thoughts. Yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that about others. Uh, other, other than ozone, I think we would agree with everything you said, or at least I do. Yeah, I would as well. Um, I, I don't. Because we don't practice any sort of scent control. No, we don't. <laughs> I, I mean, don't. we've seen these signposts like what you're yeah. talking about in the woods, natural ones that yeah. occur. And we have, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've all tromped all around totally. them and, and put our scent all over those things. And, yeah, the deer wig out about your scent for a short period of time. Right. Like there might be a seven-day window it's there. not a consistent... Sure. But Intrusion. it's not like they're they're gonna move and leave the area. No, I don't they're think. I don't think. I do think that it can create. Like I, I here, So here's my thought on it: is pressure. I, I think deer have to survive. Like a, like a buck has to live. <laughs> like and we're really aggressive to try to kill them. <laughs> like yeah. we we as hunters do a lot of things to try to kill these deer. So I think that if my life de- and they're smart, they're not dumb animals. I think that they adjust habits in in certain th- routines based on if they feel a sense of danger because of pressure like yeah. i th- i do think that they're smart like i don't think they're just they're just they're, they're super smart and so but i also think that sometimes my scent like sometimes i think deer become accustomed to stuff too like it's cultural it becomes a cult dogs have dogs are impacted by their culture greatly like they 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 form and they they mold to their surroundings, positive and negative. So you just got to be careful. Like, they'll take to bad habits quicker than they will good. They will take to good if you're consistent and you're repetitious. That's dog training. I think a deer, like, I have a buddy that's an outfitter, and, and they kill big deer every year. And so, but I've, I've helped them and I've worked with them and I've, I've learned a ton. And I've realized that these guys are really meticulous about routine. And they go into areas. The deer isn't going to leave. The, 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 if, the, if everything is there that he needs, food, shelter, water, he's not going to up and pack up and move because of the pressure, especially if he's been seeing that same he's conditioned thing to his it. whole life. Mm-hmm. It just happens to be he got old enough now that someone might try to kill him. And so I do think that if you go into an area, well, when it comes to public land, like deer don't live equally spread out through public land no. they're pocketed and concentrated because of influence that has been put on them by the great majority of hunters that access that, that and land. They, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they won't use the areas of the land where the, most of the hunters are they may still use those areas because they have a certain habitat feature sure. that they need sure. or, or a need like you mentioned sure. any kind food water whatever but they may choose when to use that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're not there when we're there. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. They yeah, get totally. conditioned to it. Totally. So uh, it, it's it's almost like we're training these deer. We're trying yeah. to train these deer mm-hmm. and to do it. And and so now we're like trying to outthink this. Yeah. But but I I just I really believe you know I I I've, I've seen I mean this is that this is that social media part of it. Like I see comments and I try to really stay out of like public forum type stuff like yeah. i just don't think i don't think it's productive like everybody's an expert and, mm-hmm. and and that's good i just don't want to be there mm-hmm. you know so but i i see a lot of comments and and stuff where people oh my god you didn't wear rubber gloves and you didn't do this and you didn't do that and i'm going wait till they see my videos because i yeah. we, we posted a video that a trail cam had me and i had seven dogs running around me and i'm <laughs> sweating my ass off and, you know like yeah you know it's june it's july there is no way for me not to sweat. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not in that good of shape. So I sweat a lot. <laughs> and so when I'm out there, like, it's rolling down me. And, and That's how we feel every time we walk in with a stand on our back. Yeah, oh, right? yeah. You I know? mean, it's like it's scent control. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. A mile and a half in with 35 pounds of gear on your back. Exactly. But, You're going to smell you know, like a gym locker. And I'm not knocking the those that do it. I'm just saying that's the beauty of this. There's a million ways to do it. Mm-hmm. I, do your own thing you know right i just wanted your opinion just because like you said you can relate it to dogs and i don't totally. know which which one has a better sense of smelling but i know they're both incredible yeah so. oh, yeah. yeah they uh yeah i when you can show me something that can fool my dog i'll really you'll really have my attention sure. you know and that's where that's where and it was the article i read was 
it was a it was a deer magazine um but it was to- and it was done in minnesota i remember that but it was totally a like a canine handler like mm-hmm. and those guys are intense like <laughs> when you i learned i learned more we do some tracking stuff game recovery tracking stuff i learned more about game recovery and tracking from like canine unit police military dogs than any deer tracker in the world because i think one of the big differences is lives depend on their work you don't find a deer eh, you know Mm -hmm. like no one's dying right if you don't find a bomb like people die Mm -hmm. and so the amount of pressure that those guys have when it comes to training they just they don't have room for mistakes and so they've gotten so good at it their craft and their trade I'll listen to those guys all day long. Like, I'll learn way more from them than, a- than anyone else. Good point. Makes a lot of sense. So. Very true. I want to ask one more question about the licking stick before we get off here. I'm fine with it, man. I love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've waited for this moment. <laughs> yeah, I want to ask one more question. Um, and it's kind of a devil's advocate type thing. Uh, Ted notices with his rubs. Now, this, this isn't the, the licking branch so much. But with the rubs, that the deer tend to use them more when they are fresh, when they still have sap in them. Sure. Have you, have you noticed? And I know with the licking stick, they're using it. I'm assuming right. they're using it more as like a community signpost type yep. of yep. Uh, licking branch sort of thing. Yeah. In many cases, like you mentioned, they're marking with their forehead glands and yep. stuff. So, here's here's one thing. Like this is, and and I, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a, the deer scientist. So I don't. Quite honestly, I don't know exactly why they... I didn't know exactly why they did it. We Googled it quite a bit. I and mean, you can find out anything if you Google it. Right. So we Googled it quite a bit. And we found different articles from scientists and biologists talking about deer communication and all that stuff. That's where we really kind of opened our eyes to the idea of, oh, it's a licking stick. It's not a scrape. It's not mm-hmm. a rub. Right. So what I think... But they seem to continue to use it. Like yeah. you mentioned, so you put this out early. And they'll just continually use it yes. as that same licking branch throughout. One of the best ones I have, like one of the best performing ones I have, I've got a lot of them out, but one of the best performing ones I have is it's a, it's a stick that I sat and watched the deer use for two seasons out of the stand. It was dead. Trees, the, the, like there's no bark on it left. There's no branches on it. It's, it looks like a toothpick. And it's, <laughs> and it's literally brown and dead and hard i don't know what kind of tree it is it's like petrified it's like (laughs) it's been there for a long time and they've used it for a long time you can tell so i looked at that and i went man every year they're using this and they have been for a long long time and for whatever reason that deer that that tree just didn't fall over it just stayed so i cut it off cut it it was perfect size so i cut it off and i brought it and i put it in front of my camera because it was like 50 yards out in the woods. It was in a bad spot. I didn't want to go check a camera there. I probably could have got a camera on it, but I didn't want to. So I moved it. I put it in front of my camera. It was next to a water. I have a water tank there. So like, I'm like, dude, I'm going to give them the buffet. It's in, right. this, it's in a food plot. I got a water tank, and I'm sure. going to put a licking stick. And I'm going to put the camera on it. So if I don't get them on the licking stick and they're at the water, I'll get them there. So I'm trying to like kill two birds with one stone. So that one performs tremendous i'll never get rid of it as long as it stays alive (laughs) as long as it now it's dead it's been dead but it just i think it's a combination of there's so much interaction on it there's so Mm -hmm. much scent on it so but i also have a few like last year i had one that the buck got is he got his antlers in between it and he just like can opener it and he snapped it off and i see that happen quite a bit I think a lot of deer do that in the wild. They'll break it off about 36 to 40 inches. They break it off, and then they lick on the tip of it. So I, I think that's natural. I've seen that before. We usually leave them to leave them like that for a week or two. And if I see any decline in its use, I change it. I just put a new tree in. Right. If, I, if they continue to use it. So I had a couple last year that in, over you know, the course of us sharing some of the stuff on our social, you'll see some of them are broke off. Some of them aren't. Some of them will be like... Um, june july and they always start out with leaves because they always have leafy branches i like the leaves because they hold scent it's like more surface area so i i usually leave some leaves i don't like the leaves because they get a little top heavy sure so you got to trim it and balance it out that's an important part of setting them up you can't have them leaning over the reason the spring is the size it is is because it forces you to put the right size tree in it it's not just like I know a lot of people, you should put a bigger spring in there and then it'll stand up straighter. Yeah, but then it won't be the right size. Right. So if, if, yours, if you put it in and it's leaning over, you need to just trim your tree, get it back up. So it's kind of like this 
it, it's foolproofing it a bit. But so I like the leaves. You put it in in June and July. They'll have a bunch of leaves. Within three, four weeks, either the leaves fall off or the deer eat them off. And now you've got a tree with some branches. And then by like September 15th to October 1st, you'll have a tree with no branches. And then all the way through the year, you'll just have a stick. And it starts out as a tree, ends up as a stick. And I will, in the next season, if I'm going to put one out there again, I'll make a decision. How much did they use this? Do I want to put another one in? I've used some that I just I feel good about that tree and I leave it in. I Some I just swap out. Some I'll put in. Oh, I'm not getting anything on it. So I'll just put a different tree in. I'll, I'll, I might move it 10 yards and I'll put a different tree in it. And that might be what hmm. makes it work. Like... It's not, I, I wish it was as easy as saying, just put it anywhere, just put a tree in it, you'll be good to go. Sometimes you got to tweak it, and I've gotten. I'd rather have it that way. That's fun to oh, learn oh, about, like, totally. which trees, because there's probably certain trees that work better in different parts of yes. the country than there is in others. Absolutely. You know, I mean, they don't, they may not have a, one of, what would you say a while ago, popple? Bass, popple. Popple, popple, popple yeah. down south, right. for example. I don't you know. You don't have cedar. Right. right. Yeah. Right, exactly. I've seen, I have seen, like, I've gotten like we made a post, and I didn't. I didn't want it to sound cocky, but maybe it does sound a little bit cocky when I think about it. <laughs> but I, I said it wasn't our idea. Someone actually messaged it to me and said, "I'm telling you, if these aren't working, it's because they're using them wrong." And I thought, you know what? That's probably true. Probably. And yeah. when I first, I have put out a lot of them, didn't get much action, so I moved it. And I, it didn't have to be like to another farm. I just moved it to a, one end of the food plot, and all of a sudden that was it. So over the years now, we've been doing them for so long, I've got, I feel really confident and I've gotten pretty good at the idea of going, I think it would work well here, and that's where I put it because I think it'll, it's, it's, you get a feel for something. Yep. It's, just like, it's just like dog training. It's just like fishing. It's like fishing. When you go fishing for the first, like I'm not a real seasoned fisherman. I go fishing, and the guy in the the guy in the, in the front of the boat is catching fish like crazy, and I'm not. And I'm going, what the hell is he doing different than I am? <laughs> and it, there's a little, it's just a slight difference that he's, you know, I went trout fishing this summer, and the one guy I was with was a trout fisherman. I had never done it before. I learned so much by watching just the little differences that he was doing to what I was doing, and then all of a sudden I caught more, and then I started paying attention to more of the little details he did, and I caught more from that. It's the same with this. You just, you do it enough, you figure out what works, what doesn't work, and you just kind of kind of tweak it as you go, and you'll get better. Like, the problem is, is if you put it out for a week and you go, oh, this doesn't work, it didn't work. Nothing, nothing works bulletproof. Mm -hmm. Nothing is a silver bullet. It's a tool to help increase your odds. Right. And you it, know, it's not, I mean, it's, that's what a lot of folks think about products many times is like i'm gonna buy this and now i'm gonna kill all these great big right. deer it's you have to dan Enfold calls it magic pixie dust it's yeah. not magic pixie right. no i mean totally. you, you use this as a tool yep to help you like you said learn more right. about the deer on your right. property right I mean, that's the fun part of it exactly and it's and it has been it has been a lot of fun because it's it it's well we talked with you guys about it a while back oh yeah and it's probably one of the things that we've been s real excited about because it's been years now. It's just the timing had to be right for us. And, and quite honestly, like we don't, our plan right now is to, to sell the consumers. Like we, we have a website and we sell it to consumers. Our, our, uh, you know, this, the, we're not retail with it. We're just, we're right direct to consumers. I think you should uh, give it a little shout out so people know exactly where they can find out. It's it's Hodeg Licking Stick on Hodeg, social media. Yeah, right? Hodeg Licking Stick is the the tags or the you know the, the channels, mm -hmm. and then the Licking Stick dot com is the okay. website. So the Licking Stick dot com. Yeah, mm -hmm. you you Google Licking Stick, you're gonna get James Brown. <laughs> James Brown has a song, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, we're trying to build our SEO. <laughs> so. That's awesome. Excellent. Thank you guys. Thanks, man. Appreciate Thanks for it. jumping on here with us. I appreciate and visiting it. with us. Thank you, Ben. You've got to be tired, brother. Hold that <laughs> camera, man. <laughs> Look at his muscles. He's not tired. He's a warrior. Yeah. <laughs> He's a warrior. Thanks, guys, for checking this out. See y'all later.